so I'm feeling um, really uncomfortable at the moment because I'm not female. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also feeling uncomfortable because I'm imagining some people might want to break. Uh, so that's scary as well. I don't know who's... I'm actually feeling a little bit overwhelmed of all the information. Who else is feeling a little bit overwhelmed? You're used to it. Okay, it's a few people feeling overwhelmed. Okay, who's actually really enjoying it and quite keen to learn some more? Oh, okay, wow. Cool, cool. Um, who's, um, who's hungry and would like their lunch? <laughs> okay. And um, who's kind of a little frustrated and would actually like more kind of participation and engagement in the, in the day? There's a few people. Okay. So actually, I think you're doing pretty well on the whole. Most people seem really happy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd like to just share a little bit about nonviolent communication um, and uh, how I feel it can um, contribute to some of the... Uh, aims and objectives of uh, the Zeitgeist movement. Um, and I think, well, I've got, I've got it up there on the, on the wall. Um, I think nonviolent communication is a language that matches the new social paradigm that we wish to co create. A lang it's a language of partnership um, rather than a language of domination. Um, so I think it can, it can be helpful to support us in moving forward to a more, more of a partnership kind of world. Um, and uh, and uh, also it can support an economic system based on human needs, um, which is very similar to the resource-based kind of economy that the Zeitgeist movement wants to create. And then also uh, nonviolent communication can support us when dialoguing with people with differing views from us. Um, you know, and that can be challenging, I'm sure. Any, any of you who've tried to get your ideas across to other people have found, found challenges there. And I think nonviolent communication can help with that. In fact, in a way, that's how it originated, really. Uh, it originated in the 1960s with um, a, a guy called Marshall Rosenberg. And he was um, a psychologist in the 60s who was trying out um, some quite radical ideas, at the time quite radical ideas, and he was called in to mediate um, conflicts uh, between um, black and white people. It was during the period of desegregation in, in America, and he was called in to mediate um, conflicts. Um, and that's partly where the term nonviolent comes from. It's a reference to Martin Luther King and going back to Gandhi as well and, uh, and their advocacy of um, uh, you know, nonviolent um, activism. And this is kind of taking it maybe a little bit into the realm of communication. So what Marshall Rosenberg found was uh, he, was, he had these people that, that wanted to resolve their conflicts. They'd come together to mediate, uh, to mediation, to resolve their conflicts. Yet the way they were talking to one another was actually making the conflict worse. So they'd end up sort of arguing and kind of fighting with one another. And it was about the way they were talking to one another and um, Marshall Rosenberg was really curious about this, and he kind of wondered, you know, why on earth is this happening? Why, why do people talk like this to one another? And uh, so he did, he did some, some study. He, he read anthropology. He read history. Uh, he, he read religion. And um, the, the, the idea that he liked most that, that he came up with that seemed to him to explain um, why this was happening was the idea of domination cultures, and that the language um, that, that people were talking was coming from a, a kind of heritage of domination cultures, um, a kind of language of coercion and, and manipulation. Um, so historically, we, we come from uh, societies that are more structured, more hierarchically structured. So in the old days, you had kings and queens, you had aristocracy, you know, then you had maybe middle classes and, and peasants. Um, and so it was very hierarchically structured. And uh, the people with more power um, imposed their will on the people with less power. And they did that physically, but they also did that with the, with kind of with the language that they were using. And so in a way, um, you know, we're, we're moving towards wanting more equality in the world, more partnership but we sort of carry with us a little bit of the baggage of the language of, 
of our culture from the past, the, you know, the more domination style culture. <coughs> so some of the uh, types of language that Marshall Rosenberg noticed actually seem to exacerbate conflict. Uh, one was a, a way of talking um, where you didn't really give people choice, the idea of no choice language. So things like you can't do this and you have to do that and you, you must do this. And this kind of goes against something I think quite fundamental in all of us as human beings, that we actually, we all want choice. We all want to be able to make our own decisions about what we want to do, um, you know, in our lives. And this goes back to a very early age. If you try to, I don't know if you've tried to feed an 18-month-old child in a high chair, you know, and if, if that child doesn't want to eat, you can't get the spoon you know, in its mouth. So this is very fundamental in us that we really want, we really want choice. Um, and blame is another, another type of language, you know, focusing the blame on other people. This is your fault. And quite often that kind of induces guilt. The other person starts to feel guilty, uh, you know, about what they're doing and uncomfortable about what they're doing if it's described as their fault. So there's also demands, um, you know, with threats, um, you know, in the time of kings, uh, you know, the, if, you, if you went against the will of the king, or possibly the queen, yeah, um, then, then you, could, you know, the, 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 the punishment was to be hung, drawn, and quartered. And I, 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 look, I saw online there was a, a previous talk from a previous year, I think, where um, someone described in, in quite vivid detail what it was like to be hung, drawn, and quartered, and it wasn't fun. <laughs> um, I think uh, in, in the workplace, I think there's this, this kind of subtle threat of if you don't toe the line, you will lose your job. And, um, and I think that's why I notice quite often when I go into, into businesses, organizations, in the workplace, you get, I don't know if you've noticed this, you get the, the kind of staff will be talking amongst themselves and sort of sniping about the management. And, uh, but not ever actually going up to you know, the manager and actually saying, you know, we're really frustrated with this, we're not happy with this. More often than not, there's just a lot of kind of backbiting and talking amongst themselves. I don't know if other people have noticed that. Have you noticed that in workplaces? Yeah. So there's this kind of threat, and it's, it's almost it's implicit. It's not explicit. It's certainly, it's certainly there. And um, kind of alongside that um, is the idea of incentives rewarding um, people for doing what you want them to do. And, and this is embedded in our, in our social systems and in our education especially. So, you know, you get a smiley sticker um, for doing what the teacher wants and then you get, um, you get grades, you know, you get um, um, medals and we're, we're kind of programmed to do things for reward and the, the reward that we end up with, the, that we're most programmed for, is money. So we're doing things for money rather than for any other reason. We didn't even know what other reason. We want, you know, we, we want the money. Um, okay. Other types of language comparison. Again, in, 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 you know, in the school, look, Susie's sitting quietly doing her work. Why aren't you sitting quietly doing your work? So we're made to feel uncomfortable because of being compared to other people. And we're gradually moving away from a focus on ourselves and what's actually, what's true for us, inside us, and our attention is drawn to what other people want us to do. So comparisons, comparing our behaviour with the behaviour of someone else. And labels, um, you know, selfish, greedy, naive. So if I, if I want your help, you know, then I'll, I'll call you selfish, and that's supposed to get you to, you know, want to help me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, if I tell you you're selfish, do you feel like helping me? No, you don't. It probably it actually gets your back up if I tell you you're selfish. But um, bizarrely, this is what we do. You know, when you're really frustrated with someone, you tell them they're selfish or they're lazy or they're inconsiderate and, and somehow expecting that that's going to make them do what you want them to do. So this is another type of the language that, that uh, Marshall Rosenberg noticed. And, um, and also... Uh, what in nonviolent communication we call moralistic judgments. Um, so the, particularly around the, the concepts of right and wrong and good and bad. And I personally think that, that 
that these concepts are one of the biggest contributors to violence on our planet. And um, I remember uh, at the time of the, the Twin Towers, when, when, when the Twin Towers were hit, September 9-11, a couple of days after that, um, George Bush came on the television and he said, the reason why they did this, the reason why they hit the Twin Towers is because we are good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, how on earth did he come up with that? And I think, but the, only way, the way I interpreted it was, um, the world is divided into good people and bad people. And um, some of the good people are so good that they, they protect the other good folk of the world from the bad guys. It's kind of a bit like the sheriff in, the we in a western, you know, protecting the townsfolk. And of course, if you're in that role of being the protector, every now and then the bad guys take a shot at you. So this is what's happened. The bad guys have taken a shot at us. Yeah? Um, and then you go across to Osama bin Laden. He was actually thinking the same thing. In a way, these guys were twins. So Osama bin Laden, he was saying, you know, George Bush is the embodiment of, of, of Satan and he needs to be annihilated. And he's doing the work of Allah or the work of good. And, and, um, and they were trying to get George Bush not to mention the, you know, the evil word to sort of turn it into a religious conflict, but unfortunately that did come out. And he created um, the, the evil axis. Again, this is a label, the evil axis. And, uh, you know, what was it? Syria, um, North Korea, and Iran, I think it was, the, the evil axis. So it gets you thinking that people in those countries are evil. You know, this is the way this label, this label works. So all of these types of communication... Um, you know, uh, 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 our kind of inheritance from a, from a different time. Um, and I think we need to, um, we need a revolution in, in how we think, and in particularly in the way we make judgments about the world. Um, weighing up the world in terms of, or weighing up, because we need to make judgments. In order to act in life, you need to kind of make a judgment about what's happening. And we're kind of programmed to make judgments in terms of is this right or wrong? Is this the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? And, um, and then we relate to people in that sort of way. So if I'm in a conflict with you, I'm the right one, as far as I'm concerned. And that immediately makes you the wrong one. And how do you feel if, you're, if I'm telling you you're wrong or, you, or you're bad? How are you going to feel? How might you feel if I'm telling you you're wrong? or you're bad? Angry. Guilty. Yeah, angry, guilty, maybe upset, yeah. And so you'll either attack, you'll either attack me back, or you'll withdraw. And this is, the, this is partly the problem, is you've only got two choices, and if you're evaluating, so you're putting things into, into these two camps. So for me, it's a little bit like, I think the, the, the evolution, if you like, is a little bit like the, the change when people used to see the world as flat and then, you know, we started to see it as round. And I think in the way we evaluate situations, we need to make that kind of radical change in the way we view the world. And I think we need to move on from seeing the world in terms of right and wrong, evaluating in terms of right and wrong. And that's still how a lot of uh, parents and even school teachers, that, they think that's their job, to teach children the difference between right and wrong. But I think we need to move on to a different type of, a different way of evaluating, and that's in terms of needs, making evaluations in terms of needs, because we need to evaluate our, our situations so we know what to do. Um, but if we, if we make needs-based judgments, um, I would say they're more essential. They get to the core of what is alive in us. And I think they also allow for the complexity that, that is part of being alive and being human. And I think they're more inclusive as well. You don't get this polarisation with people. Um, and it relates, I think, I think that needs are more closely rela related to what's really going on for us as human beings. Um, so... The way I see it, uh, as humans, we have needs. And needs are the kind of motivation for 
us doing anything in life. Um, and um, from our needs arises feelings. So, for instance, we have, we have a need for food. And, um, you know, when that need kind of arises, we feel hungry. Who's, who's feeling hungry now? <laughs> a few people feeling hungry now. So, and what that feeling of hunger does is it, it actually it propels us to act. So we have a need for food, it, and uh, it gives rise to a feeling, a feeling of hunger, and that propels us to act. So in a minute, when we're finished, based on that feeling of hunger um, arising out of your need for food, it will move you out of the room, <laughs> unless you've got your sandwiches in your bag. Um, but it'll move you out of your room to wherever you're going. To, you'll, you'll go on the hunt for some food, and then you'll get the food, and you'll eat the food, and then how will you feel? Satisfied, yeah. So this is our, this is how our, this is how we function as human beings. This is our makeup. This is our nature as human beings. We have needs. <coughs> needs give rise to feelings, and the the feelings. Another word for feeling is emotion, and I like that because in the word emotion is a sense of motion. So feelings move us to act. Um, so again, with water, you know, we need water. So every hour or so, you feel thirsty, and you go and get a drink and then you feel satisfied around that need, and it kind of subsides again. Food is every two or three hours. Sleep, maybe once a day. You know, at the end of the day, you feel really tired. That moves you into your bed, and, uh, and, you, and you get some sleep. And maybe in the afternoon, you'll get a short nap during lunchtime, if you're lucky. Um, so as well as physical needs, we also have uh, interpersonal needs, because we, I think we are social animals. Human beings don't, you know, we don't function completely in isolation. For a start, it takes two humans to make a human. So you need at least two or three to begin with. But since the dawn of time, we've always lived in groups. And part of living in groups is that we have needs, interpersonal needs. So things like trust, equality, respect, um, meaning, freedom, emotional safety... Uh, to contribute, clarity, these are the kinds of needs that we have um, to do with our interacting with other human beings. And these needs also give rise to feelings. So this is our, this is our nature as, as human beings. We have these needs to do with our interacting with people. They give rise to feelings, and then hopefully we act in a way that will uh, meet the need in, in relation to each other. Um, so, uh, the, the, our interpersonal needs are maybe not as fundamental as subsistence needs, like food and water. If you don't get food and water, you'll die. Um, with our interpersonal needs, we're not going to die, but we feel it. You know, when you don't get respect, you feel it. And, you know, the recent uprisings in, in countries like Egypt, um, the Near Eastern countries, you know, they were uprising because of things like fairness, uh, quality, respect, as well as maybe some basic needs. And they felt it, and they were actually willing to, to risk their lives um, for these needs. So, we, so these needs are very strong motivators in us, in us all. Um, Marshall Rosenberg, he, he felt that uh, he, he defined... Um, what he thought were, there were basically about 10 different areas of human need, um, which I quite like to have a, a kind of sense of what's going on for me in different situations and also what's going on for, for other people. Um, and anything anyone ever says or does, I would say they say or do things to meet a need. Um, and I think this is why if we... If we if we move from a kind of right-wrong way of evaluating to a needs way of evaluating, we're, we're, we're getting more to the core and to the essence of what's going on for us in any different situation. So it's, more, it's kind of more, it's more true to what's really happening to, to, to make those kinds of evaluations. And also, um, we can, you know, if we're in a conflict with someone, we can, work, we can look at, okay, what are my needs and what are their needs in the conflict? Um, because we can only get our needs met if the other people around us are getting their needs met as well. You're not, um, you know, you can't, 
we can, if, we're, if we're getting our needs met and other people around us aren't, sooner or later they're going to, you know, they're going to be unhappy and start causing conflict. Okay. Um, I just thought I'd mention a guy called Manfred Max Neef. He's actually done some, uh, he's a Chilean economist. He was professor of, at Berkeley, in Berkeley University. Um, he went back to Chile, I believe, and spent 20 years, 10 or 20 years working with the poor. And um, he really saw the, the value in changing the way we looked at economics. And he, he created um, a needs-based economy. Um, he's written a book called Human, Human Scale Development, and you can find that online. It's freely available. Um, and he talked about... Um, that, that wealth is not just the material wealth. Wealth is actually, we can have a wealth in terms of, all, in terms of our needs being met. We are wealth or wealthy or poor according to, where, to where, you know, whether our needs are being met. And I think we, you know, there are very wealthy people who aren't very happy. And um, you know, we can have a wealth in different ways. So I, I, uh, I went and did some work in a Camp Hill community on the border of Wales. And they work with people with learning difficulties. And they, have, uh, they do permaculture as well. And this community, they had eight houses on the land. And the people of learning difficulties lived in houses with, with, a, with a family. And they worked the land and they had workshops. And I actually felt that in terms of community, they were richer than I was. Um, and they were healthier than I was. When I went around that place, people just seemed really happy, actually, and really healthy. And, and it really struck me, especially living in London. You know, I don't know my neighbours in London. I don't have a sense of local community. I've got to try and build it with connections with people all over the city. It's not easy. But these, these people, were, they were rich in, in, in community. That need was being met really, really well. Um, and, yeah, Manfred Maxneef, he's got a, a grid of um, needs. He's got nine basic human needs, and he talks about satisfiers. So, so needs are kind of... Um, are permanent and don't change over, over time within human beings. You know, they're, they're very essential. But the way we satisfy those needs change over time. And um, he's done quite a lot of sort of investigation into that and different types of satisfiers and so on, which I won't go into now because we're almost out of time. Um, so working with nonviolent communication, we, I often use it in the context of mediation and conflict resolution. And um, what we're looking at with this process is to create empathic, an empathic connection with ourselves and others through which everyone's needs can be respectfully addressed through natural giving. Uh, and this is the, the idea, partly the idea behind this is actually, as humans, we like to contribute. That's our basic nature. We like to give. Uh, I think there's a, a, a guy called Jeremy Rifkin. I don't know if you've heard of him. He talks about the empathic civilization. And he's suggesting that humans are essentially empathic rather than selfish. Um, so if in nonviolent communication, we suggest that if we can get connected on the level of our needs, then any conflict can be resolved if, if you can connect two people on the level of their needs. Um, and the feelings, it's like a human connection between two people, the feelings that arise from their needs. We also talk about observations and, <laughs> and requests. So of how you describe what's happening, free of evaluation and free of all the labels and judgments, and also how, how you ask people for things, how you ask people to get your needs met. That's kind of part of the process as well. Um, Often when people are in conflict, they, they judge and criticise one another, attack one another. And we say that's tragic because when you attack someone, when you tell them they're selfish, it actually moves you further away from getting your need met, from getting connection with that person. Um, so if, we'd learnt, if we learnt to, to connect with our needs and our feelings and to communicate them and to connect with the needs and feelings of other people, then um, you know, we can resolve our conflicts a lot more easily. So I was asked um, to, to think of some zeitgeistian type 
um, conflicts that might go on. And I, actually, I googled um, criticisms of the zeitgeist movement. And, uh, and yeah, I came up with something a bit like, this is just naive pie-in-the-sky techno-utopianism, which the zeitgeist movement wants to impose on the world like a fascist state. Dream on, you've just been brainwashed by Peter Joseph's clever movies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to which, if you were a true follower, you might, you might reply, you're the naive brainwashed one, mindlessly consuming and polluting the earth. The world is heading for disaster and you carry on with your head buried in the sand while your actions are destroying the planet. <laughs> okay. But at the same time, you're thinking inwardly, oh my God, maybe this person's right. Maybe this is just a fantasy that will never materialise. Yeah? The world, maybe I should just give up. This is all too much. Okay. This is the way we judge in our heads. We, we judge others and we judge ourselves. So um, let's see if we can do a little translation. So this person who's saying that um, this is naive, pie-in-the-sky, techno-utopianism, um, which we, the zeitgeist movement wants to impose on the world, what, are his, what, what do you think this person's needs are, would you say, from this? Security. Security? In what, in what sense? Okay, so autonomy. So he wants, yeah, he wants freedom. He basically wants the, the freedom to choose what he does, or she. Yeah. Any other needs? He wants to feel cleverer than other people. Sorry? He wants to feel cleverer than other people. He wants to feel cleverer than other people. This person does. Okay, so that was what we would call a, a kind of evaluation or, or a diagnosis of the person rather than the person's needs. Yeah? So if, you're try if we're going to dialogue with this person, we want to get to what are, what are their needs. So I hear they need freedom. Anyone, anyone else? I, hmm? I see more in security than security. Pure. Insecure. Yeah. Insecure because yeah. he's part of something completely different that doesn't know how it's going to be my role in this new world. Yeah. And that is a little bit Okay, so he'd, li he'd like to know that he, that he has a place in, in the world. So that's a need to... It's a completely new world. Party. Yeah, yeah. For me, I also see that there's something about this term techno-utopianism. So for me, there's maybe the person... I could imagine the person thinking, you know, you've got this great vision and you can see this sort of... That, that wheel, the, the, the Venus Project wheel, and it all, you know, it just looks a bit sort of far -fetched. And so I think there's a need, I would say, that someone may be thinking like that. They really want things to be grounded and practical. Yeah? So if you say that, so is it you're really, wanting, you're really wanting to know you have freedom, you're really wanting things to be grounded and practical, and, and then, you know, we check in with ourselves. Well, actually, I, I want that too. You know, if I was a part of the zeitgeist movement, I'd imagine I would want those things as well. So that you start to create connection. And then your response, you're the naive brainwashed one, mindlessly consuming and polluting the earth. So what's that? What are we trying to say in terms of our needs there? What, what needs are we trying to express there? Or feelings. I, mean, I think there's a lot of feeling in this. Attack, yeah? Frustration. Feeling a lot of frustration, yeah? Needing to be understood, yeah, needing to be understood. I would say I, I, I feel a lot of, personally I feel a lot of anxiety when I think about the way the world's heading. I have a lot of fear and I, I, I really want to, to know that we'll, we can do something about this. I want to make a contribution. I maybe even feel some despair actually when I think about the, the state of the world. So if we start talking in this kind of way, we get a different type of connection. Okay, and then from that you get a human connection between both of you and then you can move forward with people together. And maybe through people expressing their needs you, we might learn things for ourselves yeah, that we can take on board because we all share the same needs. So if someone's talking about something they're, they're alerting us to a need that may be there to be recognised. Okay, I think that's probably about all we've got time for. Um, 
The, uh, the main website of nonviolent communication is um, cmdc.org. Uh, Marshall Rosenberg's book, Nonviolent Communication and Language of Life, is kind of like the core book that people read if you're interested in following this up. Also, there's some very good clips of him on, on YouTube these days. There's actually a three-hour sem uh, seminar that he led that's, that's really good, gives you an overview of the process. Um, I, I work in London, and there's also a reference to Manfred Max Neef there. If you can see it, it's not quite... Yeah, it's got a bit blurred there, but anyway, you can look him up as well. I think that's probably all we've got time for, yeah? Okay. Thank you.